My name is Murray, if I haven't met you uh, before, and welcome to Mentone Baptist. Our, our usual practice as a church is to work through books of the Bible together, and at the moment we are making our way through the Gospel of Mark, and we're up to uh, a section in chapter 3 today. Let's pray, ask God to uh, help us, and then what we're going to do is to be following that passage together, and uh, if you have a Bible, make sure it's open to, to Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, let's pray, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you are a good God. You are a holy God and a loving God. And Father, we thank you that when you speak, when these words that you've written in the scriptures, that they are for our benefit, for our learning, that we might know you, that we might know ourselves and understand the world around us. So please, God, help us to understand your words and to trust them and to put them into action in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the year 410 AD, the Vandals attacked and captured Rome. Uh, the Vandals, they weren't a gang of graffiti artists. They were tribes who were now well, from what is today called Germany and parts of Poland. Uh, these vandals, these tribes, they swept across much of Europe and they captured the famed city of Rome, the uh, impregnable uh, capital, the greatest city of the Roman Empire. And this was a cataclysmic event. Uh, many of us will remember 9-11 and that the shock that reverberated around the world following that day and as the, the smoke and the ash filled Manhattan. Well, the, the capture and taking of Rome in 410 AD was an event of that proportion. And in the fallout of this invasion by the Vandals, as people tried to come to terms with the bloodshed and the shock of what they had experienced, people started looking for someone to blame. Now, of course, one could have blamed or you know, taken the responsibility, given it to the, the Vandals. After all, they did it. But what ended up happening was that the Roman people looked to the Christians and blamed them. And their, their thinking was, well, the gods have allowed the sacking of Rome because the Romans had allowed the Christian God to exist among them. That was their rationale. Now, a Christian by the name of Augustine later wrote about this event and wrote uh, this enormous book called The City of God. And in this book, he noted how during the siege of Rome, many citizens looked for refuge inside church buildings. And so Christians and pagans alike were huddled together and, and finding protection from what was going on outside. Now, Augustine writes that afterward, the same people blamed Christ for the events of Rome's demise. The very same people who huddled inside the church buildings looked for sanctuary later on blamed Jesus for this event. So Augustine writes, many escape who now complain about this Christian era and they hold Christ responsible for the disasters which their city endured. But they did not hold Christ responsible for the benefits they received out of respect for Christ for which they owed their lives. In summary, we blame God for the bad and we don't thank him for the good. Now, as we survey world history, it's not unusual for a society to say of the Lord Jesus, he is wrong. What he stands for, what he claims is wrong. And it's not unusual in the history of the world for a society to say that of Christians, to say that we're wrong, and not only wrong, but even immoral and evil. And that's not how most Aussies would have thought about Christianity even 10 years ago. But society is changing quickly. It's changing faster than those guys who hoon down my street three o'clock in the morning. Rapid, quick change in our culture. Now, in our Bible reading today in Mark chapter 3, there are two accusations aimed at Jesus. One, he is mad. And two, he is evil. The first group say he's mad. It's Jesus' own family. They have come to this conclusion. So notice with me. I'm going to read from verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. 
Now, just a few verses later, we find out it's Jesus' mother, so Mary, and his brothers who are saying this, his own family. I think Jesus is somehow unstable. He's mentally unfit, and so they go to take charge of him. Now, there's a second group, and they accuse Jesus of being evil, and specifically that he is possessed by demons. So we see that in verse 22. Have a look with me. The teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. Now, the reason that seems to lay behind these accusations is that people are once again crowding in on Jesus. They're wanting to hear from Jesus. They want to see him in action. And so the the teachers are trying to come up with an explanation. They're trying to rationalize this phenomenon. Now, Jesus' family's explanation is he's mad. He's sick. The religious leaders in that country, were they're instead saying, no, 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 this man is under the influence of Beelzebul, the prince of demons. I mean, how extraordinary. We know Jesus is the only perfect human being who has ever lived. The only one who has always spoken the truth. The one who loved others perfectly with kindness and gentleness and justice and mercy. Already in Mark's gospel, we've seen Jesus healing people. Jesus has explained his mission. He's repeatedly be driving out evil spirits from people and freeing them. But instead of glorifying God and recognizing here is in Jesus, this is God. These spiritual leaders of the nation conclude, no, this is evil. Jesus is evil. Now, Jesus responds to these accusations. So he's going to use this moment as a, for a, a teaching moment. So in, in front of everybody, he calls the teachers of the Lord over. And we're going to look at three things Jesus says. And we're going to take a little time to look at each one. And the first thing Jesus does is this. He exposes their illogic. He exposes their illogic. So he says to these experts... Your argument doesn't make sense. It's illogical. So let's uh, read from verse 23. Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. All right, so in essence, the teachers are arguing Satan is working against Satan. That's their logic. It's like a man who, I don't know, digs up a termite nest and then takes it home with him and spreads the termites all underneath his house. And then people concluding, well, this man must really love his home. <laughs> Jesus says, really? That's your argument? You're, you're, uh, I'm destroying Satan. That doesn't make sense. And so now Jesus tells this parable about a home robbery. Kind of makes me think of Tony Soprano and his lieutenants, you know, charging into someone's house. It's not quite the image that Jesus is trying to portray. So let let us understand, though, that the point Jesus is making. So this parable, he says, no one can enter a strong man's house. The strong man is Satan. Without first tying him up, that is, without first defeating him. Then he carries off his possessions. That is, he's casting out demons that is from those who, whom uh, Satan is holding captive. And so the point of the parable is Jesus is the stronger man. He has come to overcome the evil one, who's the strong man, and he has come to set people free. So this is not a home invasion. right? This is more like... The Scarlet Pimpernel, you know, saving people. Or this is like the, in the movie The Great Escape and Steve McQueen's character. You know, he allows himself to be captured by the Germans in, in order to help orchestrate a prison breakout. That's what Jesus is doing. He's going behind enemy lines to, to set captives free. And so Jesus is explaining, I am not working for the evil one. I am rescuing people from him. And already in Mark's gospel, we've seen Jesus doing this. 
as time and time again, he frees people from the clutches of the evil one. He's driving out evil spirits. He's silencing them. And of course, Jesus ultimately defeats the evil one on the cross. Jesus was prepared to give his life to crush the serpent's head. You know, and even as these, these men, these religious leaders are accusing Jesus of doing the work of the evil one, even as they are doing that, Jesus knows that he is going to the cross to do that very deed of defeating evil and to set people free. As I've been reading through this passage during the, uh, the week, it reminds me you know, how dreadful our thoughts really must be of God sometimes. When we're so quick to judge, when we believe that God's ways are wrong, when we decide that God must be mistaken, when the Bible cannot be true, when we accuse God of wrongdoing. I mean, it's the world we live in, isn't it? Reasonableness and facts and goodness are not always enough to change someone's opinion. It's not, those things are not always enough to, to change the course of, of a society that it's set. Now, we don't want to abandon things like reasonableness and listening to others and goodness and truth. But when we're talking about those deep-seated, convinced hearts who have decided that God must be wrong and they're right, to change the heart, it's not an easy task. And if we're being honest, we can't do it. We can't change someone's heart. If we listen to a lot of the, the public conversation that happens uh, these days, it's, very, uh, it's, it's less about listening and respecting others as we listen. It's very little engaging with other people's uh, arguments and wrestling with them. It, how it works today, it's just insult, isn't it? It's about how can you shut down the other person faster than them shutting you down? And so you tag them with as many insults as you can. And the more insults you can come up with, and as quickly as you can do it, you shut down the conversation. That's how so much of our, our public discourse happens today. So you call them a bigot. That's one of the big ones. Uh, intolerant is another. Uh, quackery uh, has been rather popular in the last couple of months. And, and then there's the word harmful. And as soon as someone alleges that something is harmful, the argument is, is over, isn't it? You're not, not even allowed to ask to see if that accusation is true or not, if it is fair or not. Just saying the word stops the conversation. Social media these days is like that swarm of flies that devours a carcass, whoever the latest social enemy is, and you just can't stop the process. It's awful. And friends, Christians must not be like that. You may well have heard during the, the, the week, you know, or the last few weeks, that Christian is bad. Christianity is evil. Or at least those Christians who actually believe what the Bible says. We may now even be taken to court. You may be forced to attend a re-education course so that you no longer believe the wrong things. That's precisely what our Victorian Parliament decided this week. Not, not because you're necessarily doing the wrong thing. Not because we're being unloving. But because of God's love, we might dare to pray with someone or have that conversation and to dare suggest that God's design for humanity is good. Now, I imagine that the events in the, in the parliament this past week have uh, saddened many Victorians, including Christians, but many others as well, may have caused frustration and, and might create all kinds of emotional responses. But what I want us to see is what Jesus does next. So how does Jesus respond to these religious bureaucrats who are calling him evil? How does he respond So after Jesus has confronted the illogic of their argument, the second thing Jesus does is this. He talks about forgiveness. Verse 28. Let's read from there. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. 
But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. So when Jesus says, truly, I tell you, uh, Jesus is saying, I'm emphasizing this point. But that phrase is also indicating that he has the authority to do what he's talking about. And what he's talking about here is to forgive sins. That's God's job, of course. So Jesus is claiming to have the authority of God. And Jesus is also telling the crowd and the teachers to their face, you're slandering me. You're slandering Jesus. But he says to them and to others, I am willing to forgive. I'm willing to forgive you every slander you utter. What a wonderful thing that Jesus is prepared to do. To those who insult him and call him evil, he says to them, I am willing to forgive you. Years later, the disciple Peter wrote uh, to churches who were experiencing uh, difficult times. He refers to them as being exiles. This world is not our home. Uh, you're, you're being mistreated. That you're being despised. And this is what Peter had to say. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sick, uh, sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Friends, do not return evil with evil. Do not respond to slander with slander. The Bible says do good. Don't give up doing good. And back to what Jesus says. People can be forgiven all their sins. To suggest that there are sins today is almost anathema, certainly certain types of sins. But the Bible explains to what, what is good, what is not good, what is righteous, what is sinful. God is God. God understands what is best. And Jesus here is saying people can be forgiven all. I like this, love this word, all, the word all, all their sin. Which means if there's something in our past or perhaps something that you're engaging in right now that is contrary to God, the Lord Jesus offers to forgive us. All of it, he says. And that's what the cross is about. That Jesus took all our sin and freely forgives us. There is nothing so bad that God's mercy cannot overwhelm with his love and forgiveness. If you have not taken hold of this forgiveness, ask God today. Now, the second part of this uh, sentence about uh, forgiveness, it's verse 29. It's what often grabs people's attention and causes a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, but understand, you can't read verse 29 without first reading verse 28. But let me read verse 29 for us so we, we're just up to date with what's going on. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Uh, many words have been written trying to uh, understand Jesus' meaning here. What's he saying? Again, keep the context in mind. Verse 28, the previous clause tells us all sin can be forgiven by God. But now Jesus adds, except for this one sin. Now all sin, no matter what it is, it's deadly, it's wrong. And all sin can be forgiven by God by repenting and turning to Jesus. Jesus gladly forgives us. So what then, though, is this blaspheming of the Holy Spirit? Now, the verb blaspheme here is a continuous verb, which suggests it's an ongoing attitude. So it's not a one-off event. It's not a one-off uh, word that you say, but it is a continued attitude. All right, so there's a clue there. And we have other clues when we come to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what the work of the Holy Spirit is. Now, the Holy Spirit, of course, is God, the third person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit has a work to convict us of sin, to point us to Jesus. 
So when Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit in John 8, he says, when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Jesus says in John 14, he is the Spirit of truth. And Jesus also says, the advocate, that's the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So to summarize uh, all that little teaching of Jesus, the Spirit's work is to convict us of sin and to direct us to put our faith in Jesus. Now, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, therefore, is to resist that work that God is doing to convict us and to help us look to Jesus. So ultimately, blaspheming the Holy Spirit is rejecting Jesus. You know, and a person might hear the good news of Jesus many, many times. You may sit in church. You may identify as a Christian. But in your heart, you know Jesus is not Lord. Because instead you want to create your own truth, your own morality. And so to blaspheme the Holy Spirit seems to be uh, continually and ultimately rejecting the Spirit's work that points us to Jesus and leads us to repentance. In other words, the only sin that cannot be forgiven is the person who to the very end rejects Jesus. Okay? Now, I know there are some Christians who are fearful that they might fall into this category. I have a friend who struggled for this, uh, with this for many years. But, and maybe someone is here. Anyone who thinks, I may be, I maybe I'm in danger of, of being that person. If that's what you're thinking, you are almost certainly not that person. Because of the very fact that you are alert to this and you don't want to be that, I think that's evidence that this verse is not talking about you. Because the person Jesus is describing is someone who is digging their heels in and they are determined not to uh, submit to Jesus. And of course that means that there, you know, there are people that we know and love who are rejecting the Lord Jesus. So their, their current situation is not good. But it is the continued and final rejection of Christ, I think, that Jesus is referring to here. And I think that what it means for us, as we love people and we know that they don't know Jesus, do not give up praying for them. Keep praying for them. Remember, only God can change a heart. Don't give up showing Christ to them, both in, in our lives and with our words. Many of us will remember uh, a bloke by the name of Saul. Saul was a, a rather vocal activist in his day. Uh, he loved to bring down the law on those Christians. Uh, he couldn't tolerate what Jesus represented. And it just went against the grain of everything that he held uh, dear. One day, of course, Jesus appeared to him. And this Jesus denier started to profess Jesus as Lord. And of course, we're talking about the great missionary Paul. Don't give up praying for people. Do not give up showing Christ to people. Now, it would be also, just diverging for a moment, I reckon it would be a terrible injustice of this passage if we go away today and conclude, so every time someone calls me a name, or every time someone says I'm wrong, or even evil, they're wrong and I'm right. All right that would be a terrible injustice of the passage if we go away today thinking that. That every time someone says I'm wrong, they're wrong. Every time someone calls me a name, there's nothing in it, okay? Sometimes Christians do the wrong thing. Sometimes Christians make mistakes. Sometimes Christians do evil things. Let's not hide and pretend. There are people who in churches or use Jesus' name and they perpetrate horrendous things. The Bible warns us that these sorts of things will happen. So even if we are accused or slandered, we could do the humble thing and ask, well, are they right? Are they partly correct? It might be prudent to go and ask some other uh, brothers and sisters, some other Christians. What do you reckon? Is there something in what they are saying? Go to the Bible. Examine your heart before God. Friends, we are not so holy that we will never stuff up. 
And there are also times though, when what is good is called evil. And what is wrong is called good. And that's how Jesus is being treated here. And throughout the New Testament, on most many pages of the New Testament, God prepares us. This will happen to those who follow Jesus. But again, and another uh, sort of diversionary point, but an important one, I think. The last thing we want to take away from this passage today is that we have this built-up, righteous sense of pride in ourselves. As though, if people think I'm an, uh, a fool, or if people think I'm evil, that's a trophy for me to be boasting about. And to have this us and them mentality. Because I don't think that's the direction that Jesus takes us to here. So Augustine, who uh, wrote that famous book, City of God, uh, you know, when he was responding to the Romans accusing Christians of, of being responsible for Rome's demise, he also wrote another book, which is perhaps my favorite book outside of the Bible. Uh, it's known as The Confessions. I've read uh, excerpts from this book in the past, and again, if you've never read Augustine's Confessions, read it. It is good for your soul. Now, Augustine didn't grow up following Jesus. Uh, his mother was a Christian. His mother prayed for Augustine for many, many years. But Augustine wasn't a Christian. He wasn't interested in Jesus. He was the definition of someone who thought he knew better than, than what Jesus had to say. And so in his younger days, Augustine was this dude. He loved the, uh, philosophy. He wanted to engage in the latest ideas and, and theories that were being spoken about. He's a guy who loved sex and to explore sexual freedom in his own way. All right, he could easily be the character of some next, uh, Netflix series. All right? Young academic who has sexual affairs at university or something like that. But eventually... After many years of his mum praying for him, God's gospel began to pull and to pull and to pull. And eventually Augustine couldn't resist. Because there was a sweetness and, and a beauty about God's good news. Augustine came to realize his own sin, that God is right. And he heard about a savior who died for him. And he wrote this, he said, For the confessions of my past sins which you have forgiven and covered, when they are read and heard, may stir up the heart so that it will not stop dozing along in despair, saying, I cannot, but will instead awake in the love of your mercy and the sweetness of your grace. In other words, as a more mature Christian, Augustine is still looking back to the day when God forgave him and the sweetness of God's grace to him. He never forgot who he was before he met Jesus. He never forgot how God forgave him. Friends, we must never forget that. All of us, by nature and by choice, have sinned against God. We wrong others. We are deserving of God's anger and his judgment, not his forgiveness. But everyone Jesus forgives have been transformed. And that doesn't make us proud. It doesn't make us angry about our society. What it does is that it humbles us and it gives us hearts to love others. Jesus now says everyone that he forgives is included as his family. That's the, the third and final uh, part of Jesus' response to those accusations. When he's accused of being mad or bad, Jesus says, here's my family. Let's read from verse 31. Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and brothers, he said. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So the people who thought they knew Jesus best, it's his own family, at least in this moment, didn't know him best. I don't think Jesus is trying to separate himself from his family or divorcing himself from them. But what he is saying, though, is something quite wonderful. 
he is including others to be part of his family. And so Jesus points to his disciples and he says, there's my family. Jesus' family, God's family, are those who do God's will. So to be part of God's family, it's not defined by biology, by family line, by cultural associations, but by those whose lives are now conforming to God's will. And of course, in this family, there is a, found a true sense of belonging with God and his people and a sense of commitment that we are there for one another. Jesus is doing this extraordinary uh, redefining of relational alignments. As the wheels of our culture are turning and we are finding ourselves increasingly pushed out and not welcomed, remember, Jesus considers us his family. He chose us. Churches may no longer be considered uh, a good for society. Churches may no longer be considered healthy. They may be considered a danger, even a threat. But friends, it is better to stand with Jesus and be on the wrong side of society than to stand with the society and to stand against Jesus. And in the long term, trusting Jesus will actually better serve everyone else in society. You may be called all kinds of names. You may be rejected by your own family, as has happened with some here at Mento. To choose God and his ways may lead to friends turning on you, to defriending you, uh, your workplace resenting you. You may be called mad. You may be called a fool. You may be called evil. But remember... We were once like that. And remember how God has treated us. He's forgiven us. Friends, let us keep trusting him. He's accepted us and he is for us. And in the end, that counts for everything. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do uh, feel the weight of the, the way our culture is changing and it concerns us because many of the things that we see happening are not good, nor are they right. But Father, help us to remember that there was a time when we uh, were not interested in your ways. There was a time when we thought that Jesus was wrong and even evil. And yet in your mercy and kindness, you forgave us and you made us part of your family. Father, help us to live in these days with great wisdom and humility. Help us to be faithful to you, to do what is right, to believe what is true, even when it is unpopular, even when people accuse us of being mad or bad. And Father, we pray that in your mercy, that through our lives we may show the reality of your love and the good news that is there for everyone who believes. And Father, we pray that through our testimony you might indeed bring many more to know Jesus and to include many more in your family. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.